Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Satellite Image Deep Learning Video Podcast Series. Today, I'm talking with Professor Reza Algande. Professor Reza is the leader of the Data Science Group and the director of the Connectivity, Information and Intelligence Lab at the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. He is also a lead data scientist with StormGeo, an international weather insight company. Additionally, he is a research professor in the Electrical and Computer Department at the Florida State University. His research interests include spatiotemporal data analysis and computer vision for infrastructure networks. The United States National Science Foundation, the US Department of Energy, the European Space Agency, the European Commission and the Research Council of Norway have supported his research. I give you Reza. Hi Reza, great to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me in your show on your show today. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about the application that you've been working on. Would you like yeah. to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, let's do it. So I'm a professor in a Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. Uh, my work is the application of AI for uh, infrastructure networks like electric grid, railroad, roadways, pipelines. And we deal with a lot of computer vision and image processing, even time series and different type of spatial temporal data analytics. And in the last few years, we've been mostly involved with the satellite data analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. are, these, are these like challenges that have had other solutions in the past, like manual surveying of infrastructure, and it's now sort of changing the way this is tackled? Yeah, I think uh, space level data really changed the paradigm regarding the infrastructure networks. I will mention it in my, I, I, I have some slide, I can also talk more about that. But the point is that when it comes to the infrastructure, the scope is massive. So the time for monitoring and analysis really is, is huge in terms of cost, energy, and also the, the time. So I think this kind of high resolution satellites and imagery we have, SAR, optical, even the thermal, really they are adding a lot of value when it comes to the infrastructure network. So I personally, I'm very excited to see all this kind of development happening with the private companies and a and, and, and new launch we have every day. So more sensor in a space means more data in a lower bit lower cost. And that's a very great news for, for AI application. Absolutely. Very exciting time to be alive and in this in this particular uh, area. Uh, you've got a presentation for us. Should we have a look? Yeah, let me share my screen. So um, I'm going to talk more about the space level AI today, specifically for power line monitoring. And however, I, as I mentioned, we also work on the roadways, railroad, and other type of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So a bit about our, our research groups. Uh, we are Connectivity Information and Intelligence Lab uh, in uh, Western Norway uh, University, uh, and where we use AI to understand how infrastructure networks shapes our lives and impact. So I, I invite you and your audience to take a look to, to our website where we provide more information. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge this project, this interesting projects we are doing with the European Space Agency with the support, partially supports from them since 2019. And that's the Grid Eyes, where we try to develop new AI-based solutions based on the satellite's image for vegetation management in, 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 for power lines. And this is a joint work with the Storm Geo company. And I'm really uh, thankful for my colleagues there. And, I'm, and I am also a, uh, uh, senior data scientist with the Storm Geo, uh, partly, and yeah, this is exciting collaborations. Mm -hmm. I also put the links there, so in case uh, you want to know more about this kind of real application and these products. Mm -hmm. So the problem is we have a lot of power lines, and in a lot of areas, these power lines pass through the nature, you know, from the fields, farm, forests, you know, pass through the mountains, over the, the fjords, rivers, lakes, and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And these power lines are highly exposed to the nature, which makes them vulnerable. Yeah. I and saw a it, YouTube video where a tree fell onto a power line. They literally go up in flames, yeah. don't they? It's yeah. dramatic. So when it comes to the power outage, really, if we rank the reasons for the power outage, these trees come at the top of the list. And around 90% of the power outage all around the world is due to the vegetation, connection to the power line, and usually due to the high winds, so on and so forth. 
Yeah, that's a massive, a massive fraction of outages due to that single. It cold is. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, in Norway, just 80, around 86% of the outage are due to the outage. The similar numbers are in the US and then all around the world. Mm. And electric companies spend something between 50 to uh, 1,200 euro per kilometer of line per year to maintain the clear cuttings, monitorings, and all aspects of the vegetation management for power line to keep mm. the reliability and resilience of the grid to the standard. So, so we're probably talking the, millions yeah. of millions of pounds, even for relatively small networks then. Indeed. So this, this vegetation management is one of the, the big uh, chunk of uh, basically money that they need every year in their budget for electric mm. companies. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason we, we, we've been interested. Okay, let's see how can we do this? How can we use satellites and image and to improve this kind of uh, business line for, for power lines and for, yeah. for power companies. So if I just want to you and, and sense of the, the, the scope and the scale of this problem, if we look at the, the, the amounts of power lines we have in Europe, it is we have enough wire to go to the moon for 25 times. Wow. And that's just the Europe. You can imagine in the world that this number is four or five times more than that. Yeah. So it's huge. It costs a lot to keep eyes on electric grid. What we do traditionally to, to monitor the grid is basically we have to send a guy, just go watch the line and, and walk and do a visual inspection. Mm -hmm. If the guy is lucky, there is access, there is an access road so they can drive. And in a lot of cases, there are not because they are in the nature, these power lines are in the nature. So we have to send a helicopter to do the inspection, the visual inspection, and this is so expensive and it's so prone to the nature. Yeah. In recent years, we start to use the drones, but drones have more and less similar issues and limitation, even more limited than the helicopters. Is that and sort of flight permission limitations? Flight permission limitation, the, the batteries, the, the control, the regulations, right. and they are very prone to the high wind, you know, and, and, and the weather condition, the altitude, you know. So there are practical limitations for drones. They are fantastic, but yeah, there are some kind of a limitation. And above all, it's a time-consuming process. Remember mm. about these thousands of kilometers of the line. How long it takes you to you fly a, a drone or a helicopter, and how much you're gonna spend? And in on terms the of other thing, sorry, yeah. in terms of what they're looking for, are they literally looking for trees on the line or just trees getting close to the line? So they they look into a corridor surrounding the, 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 the lines, basically in, we have the right of way for, for power line. We are interested to know what is the situation of the vegetation in the vicinity of the power line at the both sides and also the under undergrowth vegetation, the vegetation that grow under the, the power line. And it's varies company to company, but something's between, I would say 10 to maybe 40, 50 meter each side of the line. So we are talking about something between 20 to 100 meter corridor that right. need to be inspected mm -hmm. frequently to make sure that the, everything is safe and the vegetation are in the right conditions. And, and therefore, electric companies do this process uh, in some periods, you know, some of them that they do that. And these periods can take from one or two years to 10 years when basically to, to cover the whole territory, the whole uh, amounts of power lines they have. Mm. So the situational awareness is not updated in many cases. Right. And that's the problem. Yeah. From the other side, we have the satellites and major technology. And these days, the price of the data coming down and down and the quality is going higher. So we can get these days 30 centimeter satellites image or 50 centimeters from commercial provider with a much, or not much, but a cheaper price than what it was, I don't know, five years ago or 10 years ago when it was not available, you know? So, mm. and we have a frequency of revis revisitings for any given parts in the world. And this frequency of the updated image is getting closer to a, hourly image if we consider all commercial satellite provider that we have in the market these days. Mm -hmm. 
So why not? Why don't we use this kind of high resolution satellites image and provide the frequency of data situational awareness for a massive infrastructures like power lines? Mm-hmm. And that's basically the motivation for doing this uh, grid eyes project. So the use case that I'm going to talk today about, one of the use cases we work on is an area in the western part of the Norway is a kind of a suburban uh, power grid. And we use two satellites image, play this one uh, with four channel and max or world view two with eight channels. And also, because we have a collaboration and partnership with the electric grid in that region, we also had hands-on LiDAR data that they have, and we use the LiDAR data as a ground truth for validation and, and basically uh, tunings or, or machine learning algorithm. Mm-hmm. So here is the story. We have the information, basically the GIS shape files from the location of the power line. So using that GIS, we geotag the, the, the corridor for the power line that needs to be monitored and we on the satellite's image. So, and for to cover this corridor, we come with this patch of different mosaics of the satellite's image, which is this kind of high resolution multispectral. And, and we make these mosaics and then, then we fit the mosaics to our deep learning algorithm, which I'm going to explain more about that. And the outcome of this, MA segmentation is basically a binary mask that tell you three or no three. Okay. What can we do with this binary mask? Basically, we go back to the MH and we, 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 we cover the whole uh, power line right of the corridor and we calculate basically how far our vegetation to the power line, what is the density of the vegetation, and, we, and, and with this kind of information, we calculate a risk of a vegetation risk for power line. And this way, when we put everything together, the company can have a kind of interactive map that which tell them where they need to go and do some kind of clear capturing streamings or where they need to put to pay more attention to the vegetation uh, near the power lines. Got a question on that. In terms of like Please. the tree, is there like a distinct point at which you classify something as a tree, like it's above a certain height or diameter rather than just say a bush or something very good question yes the the height of trees is very important we also works on the this what i show here today is a 2d vegetation modeling but we are also working on 3d vegetation modelings and to come up with the, the kind of a 3d uh, image of the, the 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 canopy and yes and short question short answer is that yes the height of trees is important mm. yeah and we, we consider that is there any like classical approach where you know using the look the look angle you can see tall objects moving that that would be applicable as well? Yes, we have this kind of photogrammetry approach which we use two different images from two different angles to to estimate the height of the objects at the ground level. That's one of the the, the, the techniques that can be used. Also, there are some kind of more um, data driven approach like different variation of the, the deep learning to estimates. The, the height of uh, vegetations and yeah so there are a few different options to estimate the height of the trees mm-hmm. yeah and or maybe use the lidar and some kind of use the lidar to train your your your, your machine learning algorithm to estimate the height of the vegetation so right. yeah so the methodology we use, the deep learning approach we use is a unit, the variation of the unit for vegetation segmentation. And very brief, we have the satellite image patch. We, we have this kind of encoder, decoder based architecture. And this model has a cascade of the convolutional layers. And for example, we use ELU, which is a very well known activation function that a lot of people use in these fields. And and if we also use a binary cross entropy for the loss functions. And, and as I mentioned, the outcome of this is the a binary map for tree, no tree. Mm-hmm. And in this case, we extract 80 by 80 pixel satellite patch along the power lines. And we did, that. We did all the data augmentations and split it randomly between testings and, and, and validation 70 to 25. Ratio and we validated that this data set, the accuracy compared to the LIDAR ground truths we have. And also uh, for the for the inference and implementation with these segmentations, as I said, 
uh, this 80 by 80 patch are basically uh, generated from the starting of the satellite image and we consider 50% overlap between the patch and we perform this kind of uh, labeling or sorry, segmentation on each patch and then we stitch back them together to cover the whole area. So this kind of overlap between patches is important. And I have seen that also in uh, another uh, discussion you had with one of your guests last time. So yeah, we do the yeah. same here. And the 80 by 80, if you've got a 30 centimeter pixel, that's it's, just to cover the width of where the trees should be uh, removed. Yes. Is that right? This, this this case is with a 50 centimeter image, and this 80 by 80 basically means 40 meter corridor. Yeah. Okay. So that would cover the whole width of where the power line yes. should be and the margin. So exactly 20 meter each side. Yeah. Yeah. The accuracy uh, compared to the LiDAR is around 95% in terms of the location of the trees. And that's a very good result uh, compared to uh, the works we have seen and the literature we have observed. And when we put everything together, I basically we made this kind of animation. Let me play it. So here's a kind of overview of what's happening. We have this kind of a sliding window or this, this, this shows basically the patch of the, the image. In each patch, we do the, the, the labelings of the vegetation and we calculate the, the vegetation density and distance to the, to the line to come up with these risk functions. And when we put everything together, we come up with this kind of Google map-ish uh, uh, maps that shows that basically the red points here means that where there is more concentration or density of the vegetation near power line or, or in other words, more risk for the power line and the, and, the, and the green points means that less risk. So vegetation management teams in electric companies can look at these maps and decide which part of their territory or section of the lines needs more attention or some kind of taskings for vegetation management that they need to do. Just so I understand, how do you go from the segmentation map to the risk score? Is that based on just a calculation like number of pixels associated with tree times distance to yeah, we come up with a kind of yeah, very good question. We come up with a kind of a, a Gaussian function that uh, calculate the density of the trees in that patch and and, and assign a number uh, between zero and one to that 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 piece of line. So and uh, Basically, the risk function we consider is also uh, explained more in, in the paper, but that's the idea. Yeah, it looks pretty oh, well yeah, correlated with sort of in that in the image there. You can see the low risk where there's fields, and then high risk where there's obviously forests. So it looks quite intuitive. The the results that are predicted there. Are there any sort of subtleties in the predictions that you found interesting? Oh, sorry. What was the question? I was just wondering if there's any like surprises in the predictions that you produced. Well, um, actually, the, what we did, we compare our results with the, the, the historical data we have regarding the vegetation failure or, or the kind of a incidence in that area. And we could see kind of a nice correlation between the area. Usually area which are problematic are the area that the vegetation getting very close to the power line or they are in a kind of the slope. And when we talk with the, 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 the clients, the end user, we could see some, some correlation. So it was surprising in a term that in a lot of cases we pinpoint to the right area in terms of yeah. the topography of the area and the history of the problem in that special section of the, the line. Mm -hmm. but, but then we ask ourselves, in addition to the vegetation density, what else can be important for, for vegetation management and also, and in other words, what is a better risk function regarding vegetation risk for power line? Is it just the, the density of the trees and, and how they are and where they are located or there are other factors? And we found that one of the other factors is the type of those trees, the type of the, the species of the tree, because the risk comes from interaction between the tree and wind. So tree is a kind of a structure, you know, and, 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 and basically, the strengths and resistance of this structure to the wind define is this tree will bend or broke on the power line or not. Mm -hmm. And that varies from type to from one type of the trees to the other types. Mm. 
So then the next question for us was, how can we detect the three species using satellites image, high resolution satellites image? And that mm -hmm. was the start of the story for the second part of our research. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the three species, uh, usually we have these three species inventory maps like this one at the in these slides, which are provided by the forestry department or the forestry agencies in each country, in each region. And these kind of uh, inventory maps basically comp uh, comprise from the different sections. And in, like what we have here, we have three different color for spruce, pines, and deciduous trees. And it, in each one of these sections, they go and check the trees in that region by different methods. And they label the whole area with the majority of the trees that are located in that area. Mm -hmm. For example, this one is a spruce green because the most of trees in this area are spruce. But definitely there are some deciduous, some pine, some other type of trees in this section. However, the whole section uh, for the age of works and also for the for the in, in because of the scope of the work, just label to the one tree. So then, 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 then the question is that how can we improve this the, the resolution and also the accuracy of such these three species inventory? Mm -hmm. So we come up with these frameworks for three species classification. Basically, it is a weekly supervised learning strategy for three species classification. Uh, we start with this uh, three species inventory database from the forestry agency. In, in, on top of that, we also acquire some high resolution satellites data and we do tree segmentation, very similar to what I show you in the previous slides. So we mm -hmm. come up with this binary mask to pinpoint where are these trees exactly located. And then we come somehow we combine or project that mask to the these three species uh, database we have. Mm -hmm. And then we do this unsupervised tree species relabeling and then we fit the relabeled three species inventory into a three species detector, which is in our case is a unit for, for multi-label segmentation. Just to clarify, and the tree one, species map that is human annotated, is it? This one, this one, yes. The, the, yep. the beginning is the human annotated provided by the uh all the all the approach that they have in the forestry departments to create such a maps. Mm. This one. Is a is a kind of automated because it's a come up comes from the high resolution map similar to what I show you. Mm -hmm. And when we combine together, this is a kind of a big day supervised approach for re relabeling the, the, the trees mm -hmm. and, and the species in this month. And here is basically a unit. So and it's a kind of a semi-supervised. That's the reason we call the whole platform, the whole framework a weekly supervised. Okay. Uh, I will. Ha I have a better slide that shows what how the quality changed. But you may ask, what is the ground truth? How can we say that we did a good job in super resolution of this creating a super resolution for the tree species map or or the or the or the or enhanced tree maps? Mm. And the ground truth in our case comes from multi-temporal uh, image analysis. Because with the when it's come to deciduous trees, they, they lose their leaves in different seasons. So when we look right. at the, the, the tree maps or tree detection over the seasons, we can better, for example, pinpoint the deciduous. And also for the other times, we also, because we work closely with these partners and with these collaborators who provide this kind of data, we also get hands on some kind of a, a ground based uh, visual inspection. Mm -hmm. And we compare, we combine that visual inspection plus the temporal, multi-temporal satellites image to come up with a ground truth so we can better cross-validate score results. Mm -hmm. Here is more about the, this relabeling process in a latent space. At the top is the reality. Basically, for example, we have some pine, we have a deciduous, and then surrounded by some pines. And in other parts, we have more deciduous. We have a single pine, for example, here. What happened after the visual inspection and then when we pack the different part of the forest, basically this section all will be labeled by the majority, which is pine. So that's the reason we changed the color to, to show that the label for this area is pine. And the other way, 
for the parts with more deciduous trees, if we have a few pine, we also call that, usually they also call that section deciduous. So as you see, me, the, the minority trees in a region will mislabeled. So what we are doing, basically, we use this convolutional autoencoder to move this kind of maps into a different space and to the feature space. And in the feature space, we try to relabel the features based on their position in the new space, a new yeah. domain. And after relabeling, we map them back to the reality, to the, to the ground level. And, and, and that's, that's the whole process of relabeling. Hmm. And then we, we, can, we compare our results basically or, uh, with the normalized confusion matrix for this classification map between predicted label the, or the tree species that comes out of the tree species detector uh, with the true tree types, which comes from our ground tools. Mm -hmm. The left-hand side is the, uh, the, the relabeling process using our weekly supervised approach. And the right-hand side is a confusion matrix without relabeling and using just a classic supervised approach for uh, tree type detection. And we can see that clearly that the, with the relabeling, we get a better performance, is, is more diagonal compared to what we see in the uh, basically classic approach without relabeling. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the left hand side here is the original. Uh, uh, an example of the original tree inventory, the spruce, pine, deciduous with three different colors. And the right hand side is the generated in tree inventory with our approach. Mm -hmm. And we can see that how more detail are observed and how we can basically detect the different type of trees which are surrounded by other type of the trees. And, 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 and also, we can even cover the area that are not originally covered in the original map because we are using this kind of a tree labeling approach and the tree detection approach we have. Yeah. And, and in other words, we can enhance the quality of this tree inventory database. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and imagine there is a power line passing nearby. And for that power line or roads or railroads, you know, when we instead this type of database we use this type of database we can precisely or better we can say something about the type of the trees which in other way the type of trees can translate into the strengths of that tree to the different level of beans or or or, or a better way to calculate the dynamic risk of vegetation to mm -hmm. the weather and to the wind condition and more certainty and more reliability for the uh, operators who are working in that area. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to verify this, sorry, technology. So this is a, the result of this study is published in uh, IEEE transactions on geoscience and remote sensing a few months ago. And I invite you to take a look to this paper if, if something's in your interest or your audience interest. Mm -hmm. And I wrap up my slide with these few takeaways. These days, satellites can offer a lot of advantage to us in, in terms of being cheap, easy to access, frequency, frequent revisiting, and for monitoring power lines, especially when it comes to the vegetation. And this, this conventional methods are still in need, so we don't need to put them away. No, definitely we are going to use the legacy methods we have for running the grids, the infrastructure, and the monitoring. But with the AI method, we can come up with a complementary approach and, and improve the performance of uh, classics methods we have mm. in terms of monitoring and situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Also, tree species detection is essential for better calculating the risk of uh, trees for power lines. And yeah, and this is my contact. Also, I would like to thank Michele Gazelle, my PhD students who did a most of these this nice works by, uh, by himself, and, and also that's uh, Michele contact in case uh, you have any further questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the presentation, Reza. And sure. uh, I'll put the, uh, the links you mentioned in the show notes at the end. Uh, are you active on LinkedIn or Twitter where people can follow your, your updates? 
Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on both LinkedIn and Twitter. And if they search my name, it's pop up in, on LinkedIn and also on Twitter. Fantastic. Okay, I'll drop that in the show notes. And once again, thank you so much for the presentation.